with. Yeah. Why is it important? Why do we need to know this? Because knowing will make you understand and appreciate electricity in a big scale. We want to understand what is this guru stuff that we see around us? What is this magic? What is this sorcery that's happening? Because uh, electricity is perceived as something really magical. You don't see it, but it's there. You can feel it, but it did wonders to us. If it wasn't electricity, we wouldn't be here now. Uh, all, you, all what you have to reverse our entire civilization is to cut off electricity. No electricity, we're back to the Stone Age. So that's a really, really big leap for human being to discover electricity and how to generate electricity. Think about it. No electricity, nothing will work. You can't even dig oil without electricity. How are you gonna dig oil without power? So, so far electricity dominates our needs. Electricity is very important. Electricity is a big part of our energy needs and it's going to be for, for a while. And uh, how to generate electricity is a big field of research. People are trying to come up with new and newer ways to find ways to generate electricity. Mm -hmm. And everything runs on electricity. So we need it. It's a clean form of energy. But how do we generate it? That's the question. And what is it? And how did, it, how did we come about to use electricity for our purposes? So we'll talk about the relationship between physical, physical objects and electrons. And what is electricity? How did we? Realize what electricity is. How do we how will be able to contain it? How do we contain electricity in like jars? They used to have batteries in the ancient Egyptian and Chinese. They used to put batteries in jars. They put acids and metals and they have electricity. And what was, what was the use of that? And how did it become very abundant? And how were we able to make it flow with the current? We'll talk about that in a lot of details. And stop me if something doesn't make sense. Why do we need to understand electricity? Because you're going to be working with it. If you don't understand how things works, you cannot fix it. It will be very challenging for you to pinpoint the problem. So troubleshooting is the one of the most issues you have to deal with in HVAC. 70% of all the problems in HVAC are what? Electrical. Mechanical parts are really less and less problematic. It's mostly electrical. So we need to understand electricity. We have to understand where is it present? How do we measure it? And what is it doing? Four types of electricity generation. I'll talk about it. We just digest it. What are conductors and what are insulators? Insulators are also known as non-conductors. What makes a material conductive or non-conductive? Again, there's some, a little bit of too much chem chemistry and physics, but it's necessary and I'll try to make it simple enough for somebody to remember. We're not gonna go too much into the nitty gritty, but what do we need? Why do we need to know this? Going back to the atoms. Everybody knows what an atom is. We all took some physics or some science in high school. We know what it, what's an atom. Let's just focus on the simple form an atom. So there, the nucleus of the atom it has inside the nucleus there's protons and neutrons. Neutrons are have no charge. Spinning around the atom is electrons. So think about it, everything is energy at the end. But till this day, they don't know what makes mass. Why do we have matter? So at the beginning they thought that protons has all the matter in it. This is where we have mass. Then they did the large hydron collider and they cracked out the protons. They want to see what's inside. And they found a whole bunch of stuff and still they don't, they don't know what gives the atom its mass. It's very like, mind-boggling stuff. If you watch a few documentaries about, there's a documentary called uh, Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman, really amazing documentary. It's kind of mind-boggling. The, the point being is everything is just energy. <clears throat> what is mass, we still don't know, but everything is a form of energy. So we have what looks to us as solid or matter here, but again, we still don't know what is it. Uh, up to the, recently, we just realized or thought that protons is where we have mass or matter, but it's not. Again, we're not gonna go deep into it, we'll keep it like that. That's what we need to know. So proton has matter, and proton has a charge. The charge of the proton is positive, electrons are negative. So the 
amount of protons here, the charge keeps the protons, keeps the electrons spinning around the nucleus. So they're always spinning, 24 seven. This book has atoms in it with spinning things. Everything is moving. It's kind of mind boggling. This floor I'm studying, it's moving. But it's moving in a speed that interacts with my body speed so it feels solid to me. At some point, it can go through it. That's why waves go through solids. X-rays go through solid. Some light can go through solid. So and then it's clear to know that there is nothing solid. I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but if you think about it, before the Big Bang, there was nothing. If you go from not even a biblical sense, there was nothing. I think there was nothing and everything just happened from, I don't know what, some kind of explosion. And if you think about it, they think the entire universe came from something as big as the, pin, the tip of the needle. So it's very, very mind-boggling. Again, this is a broken part, this is an atom, we have electrons. Science has been trying to identify all the elements on the ground and the, on, on, on Earth, and they keep adding new elements. Just try to identify what we have. We still don't know all the physics behind matter, but we keep identifying elements and put them in a table based on how much weight they have and how much electrons they have. This is as far as we know. We try to organize things and see what they look like so we can have a relationship with them. In the beginning, they also realized that some elements are attracted to other elements. Why? Because they can form a bond. When two elements bond together, they share an electron. Sometimes two and sometimes three. So the electrons will orbit through two atoms together. And that's what bonds them together. And we can make an element, I mean uh, a molecule, which is more than one element. So the simplest form of matter is element and an atom. More than one element will be a molecule. So water is a molecule. It has two hydrogen atoms bonded with an oxygen. And it exists this, this way until it changes to something else. Okay, so again, we said that the periodic table was organized based on the amount of uh, electron in the last orbit. So this is one, those electron at the end, mm -hmm. and based on their mass, and the mass is the proton. And we realized that there are materials that are conductive and materials that are not conductive. So if we look here, we have what is called the semiconductors. And here we have the metals, which are conductive. And why is that? Well, I'll explain. And we have here non-conductive material. So in this region here, like the carburetor, for example, is in the fourth row. We take this out, one, two, three, and four. It has four electrons in the last orbit. And electrons go in kind of orbits. For example, if the Earth has one, more than one moon, based on the size of the moons, they will be in different distances. Make sense a little bit? Based on the gravity, lighter, closer orbits will have a lot of moons, further orbits will have less lightweight moons, and so on and so forth. So the same thing goes with atoms. So for elements, we had 110, now 118, probably something was added in the last year or two, and they always discover new ones. Every element has different mass. Charge, charge is the amount of extra electrons in the last orbit. Of course, there is more than one orbit. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, and so on. And the number of electrons. So you would think that metals have heavier nucleus and it has loose electrons. So it has the ability to attract other electrons into its orbit because it has heavier mass. And that's why metals are conductive. They conduct, they can blend and bring in more electrons to them. The carbon atom has four electrons in its last orbit, which means that was the capacity, it's at full capacity. <clears throat> so it's less probable that it will lend an electron or take one. So it's more stable. It's not conductive, it's not loose. And again, that's why carbon atoms or plastic or rubber do not rust. They don't have a loose electron there trying to rust or reunite with oxygen. 
Uh, molecules again, they're a form of more than one element. For example, H2O, CFC, hydrofluorochloride, which used to be a refrigerant, and CHCF. So all these are molecules. Probably you have to study that for your EPA exam. They want you to know what's a molecule and what did it do to the environment. So these are molecules, and we can form molecules. You can generate water. You can make water out of hydrogen. And that's how we have uh, uh, hydrogen cars. You can basically oxidize hydrogen. You carry a tank of hydrogen with you. You oxidize it, and you produce water from your muscles. So you can make and synthesize some uh, elements. So much so good? Not too much? Okay. So conduction depends on the number of electrons in the last orbit, and also how heavy the nucleus is. The heavier the nucleus, the more it will be willing to knock off electron or attract electron. Silver and copper have one electron, so it's really conductive. That one is loose and going out crazy and can go knock out into another element, another atom next to it, and so on. So silver and copper have only one. Insulators have four or more, so they are more stable. Polymers, rubber, wood, they're all carbon-based. Carbon has four bonds in it. We got single uh, electron and double. Sometimes you can knock out double, sometimes you can knock out single. And electrons have negative charge. So I want you to visualize a copper wire. Imagine a row of copper atoms sitting to each other and sitting to next, next, uh, next to each other. And in the beginning, you just push one electron in. They will all go on to push further until the end of the cable. So what you're doing is like you have a big tube of water and you make a river of it to go all the way to the end. So the same thing that's going with electricity. They all have their electrons and just pushing in new electron as the energy and to move through. So what you're buying is a bunch of electron movement in your house. You're buying the movement, the energy. So you put some energy in to knock it out and to wave all the way to the back, but it's still there. For example, a rope. If you put a wave in a rope, the rope is still there, the mouth is still there, but your energy went all the way through. Then, make sense? Do it for me. Okay. <laughs> make sense a little bit? Is it like the noise you hear from like, you like snap a rope or something like that? Isn't that noise you hear? That's your energy. Like the energy yeah. Area, yeah. Right? yeah. That's the that's the energy you, you can put it. It's an energy again transformed from one form to another. Never vanishes. You can never create it from nothing. So all the energy we have now, with all its forms and shapes and colors, came from the Big Bang in the beginning. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's been there for ages. <clears throat> again, these are the orbits. Nucleus. The first orbit takes two. Second orbit like 18, and so on and so forth. Everyone has a limit of how much it can contain, how many electrons can contain. Until the end, depends if you have two, that will be easier to knock out. You don't have to remember this stuff. It's just to explain to you, it's a segue for you to understand what is electricity. So you don't have to remember all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And every nucleus has mass, has charge, has a field, and has a frequency. Oh, what is the frequency? How much does it vibrate? Oh. So, again, think of energy again. What happens if you heat a piece of copper really hot? It's gonna expand. First, what happens? Expand. Then what happens? Yeah. Keep heating it. Melt. Before it melts. Mm -hmm. Even if it melts, if you keep heating, what happens? It will have. Well, you're putting a lot of heat. Heat is what energy. So you're making it vibrate harder and harder. At some point, it will start to vibrate so much that it becomes glowing. It will start to glow. That glow you're seeing is the energy, the amount of vibration that's happening to the electron. You're so excited. If you keep melting it, the bonds will start to break and it become liquid. If you keep heating it, eventually it will evaporate. You can't evaporate metal. 
to put the NFT. When they when they did the test on the nuclear bomb in the Manhattan Project, they put the bomb in a, in a steel tower. After the, the explosion, the steel tower was gone. It was evaporated into gas. So it evaporates, it becomes really agitated, it's a lot of energy. What you're putting there is energy. So basically you're vibrating all those electrons too much that it's, it's not like the, the vibration will become glowing. And uh, again, vibration comes as uh, sound, vibration comes as light. Um, if you look at infrared, what is the infrared? If you heat a piece of copper or a ceramic in a space heater, it's glowing hot. Even if you have glass, you're gonna feel the heat from far away. That's not conduction, that's not air. That's just the wave. The heat is coming to you. The sun is sending energy from millions of miles away, and there's no medium. It's space, it's vacuum. That's the vibration of the explosion of the sun, the surface of the sun, coming all the way to Earth here. Basin waves is how much energy is there. So the flow of electrons requires force just like the flow of water. If you want a lot of flow, you have to push it with some force. It could be a friction, electricity. Friction is static electricity. Chemical is battery, magnetic, and that's also mechanical. We'll talk about that, how does magnet and mechanical does generate electricity. And heating similar metals. So these this is effective to a point, but it's not as effective as having an alternator or generator, which is mechanical, <coughs> a magnet. Heating similar metals also has some potential to generate electricity, but very, very small. People are still working on that to make it a little bit more effective, but it's not that much. So, so far, magnetic, which is the basis of having power generation, is still dominant. Okay, and friction? basically static piece of wall. You walk in the winter wearing uh, your pajamas, you touch the doorknob, and you discharge. So friction does dislodge some electrons, but it's not a lot, and there is no flow. It's only a spark. That's why it is exact. It's only a spark that comes at once. So static electricity is caused by friction, and there is no flow. So did anybody, does anybody know what a capacitor is? Who doesn't know what a capacitor is? A capacitor. Mm -hmm. I'll show you what a capacitor is. A capacitor is a small can where we can charge. It used to be, made, uh, used to be filled with wool. Just, now it's filled with oil. And it's the same thing when you, when you rub a balloon. You just have a charge. So when you rub a balloon, you become, or when you walk across the room or on carpet, you become a capacitor. So this capacitor, holds a charge, but the charge comes at once. In a millisecond, once you touch it, you get the spark. So this is empty, because after two days you empty a capacitor. So that's a capacitor, it's similar to a battery. What is the difference between a battery and a capacitor? They all have charge. It's just quick. This is just for at once, and the battery has a flow. It goes slowly, you have flow, you have current. Current is flow. No steady flow. Once it's balanced, there is no more flow. So once you touch the doorknob and you get zapped, no more. Just a touch, just the beginning. Questions? Okay, batteries. We know batteries. So they have two electrodes and they have electrolytes, just like our body. Electrolyte is a substance that ionizes when Solvent is suitable ionizing solvent such as water. This includes the more salt of salts, acids, bases, uh, and bases. Base is the opposite of acids. You don't have to remember all these details. So if you ever disassembled a battery, who, who did that out of curiosity one day? What did you just find? The positive has a big rod, and there's a lot of paste inside, and some kind of Insulation in the middle. So what happens? What about the car battery? What's in the car battery? Acid. Acid. That's your electrolyte. It has electrode plus and minus. Once you connect it together, you complete the circuit and you start your reaction. <coughs> so what happens? There's a reaction, and most batteries produce what? While well, there is a reaction, 
It's not electricity. What happens to your phone when you charge it? Huh? Yeah, what else? Does it feel hot? Yeah. Yeah. It's doing a chemical reaction. So when you discharge your phone, it's discharging the battery. One of the byproducts of that discharge is heat. So your phone gets hot because the battery is dissolving stuff. So there's heat coming out. When you charge your phone, or discharge your phone, your phone gets hot. When you talk on the phone for a long time, especially the old phones, it gets so hot because the battery is working a lot to dissolve. So it's a chemical reaction that produces the flow of electrons. And again, the amount of uh, uh, dissolving the chemicals is measured in a way that will give you a certain flow. And they give you the battery rated with voltage and amps. If you look at your phone battery, if you want to touch your phone battery or computer battery, it says the volts. I'll tell you the amperage. So how much voltage, <coughs> how much amperage? Amperage is the flow. How much, how, what is the speed? where we do this chemical reaction. Dry cell batteries made out of zinc as an empty electrode to give away electrons. There's like also manganese, that dioxide, carbon rods. So we, get, we will always have this kind of uh, connection that the pays to it. A rod, this is a battery, this is our battery. And we have paste in here. And once you connect those two, you have a connection and the materials start to dissolve and decompose. So dry cell batteries that you throw them away, once you react the whole stuff in the battery is gone. With chargeable batteries, we can put electricity and reverse the reaction and you get the original material. Again, that's the concept of a battery. You don't have too much about it, just chemical. And there's an electrolyte in it, positive and negative. What? Okay, two arrows with that. You know we have two types of uh, electricity. AC, alternating current, and DC, direct current. We'll, we have a whole chapter about that. So battery will give you direct current. So we'll give you, the positive will give you current, and then we put the current back into the negative. So it's always at the same rate, it's not going to change. Don't worry too much about that. We will talk. Huh? Yes. Completely. Same as, we, as, your, as, as your car, AC or DC? DC. DC. 12 volt, constant, until you run out of battery. It's a complete constant, it's all the 12. And that's why if you ever wire the car radio or something, you just use uh, the positive, and you put the negative where? In any piece of the car. It's going to be ground. So you're just taking the electrons. And you have to complete the circuit and put it somewhere. Otherwise, mm -hmm. there's no flow. Make sense? A little bit? What is the battery? It's what's happening. It's the face inside. You are connected to those two sides, and you are starting the reaction now. Reaction will happen, and the light bulb will take all that electricity coming out of the battery. Until eventually, we run out of the entire chemicals in there, and it's gone and you have to replace the battery or charge it again. If the chemicals inside allow you to do a reverse uh, flow. Thermoelectric is converting heat into electricity. How do we do that? Somebody at some point realized that if I heat two metals that are different next to each other, they will vibrate at different rate. Make sense? They're different material, different electrons. Energy is vibration. They're not going to vibrate at the same rate, right? Again, you have a drum set, a small drum, and a big drum. If you get in the same, they have different sounds, right? Yeah. Same with your guitar. Same. Yeah. You strum the all the strings, every one of them vibrating at different speed. So this difference in vibration is creating an electrical potential. One of them is higher than the other. So somebody thought, okay, if one of them is higher than the other means there is electrical potential, which means different in pressure, which means there's going to be some flow. High and low, we have to have flow at some point. Correct? If you, again, in a, if you have a guitar and you strum <coughs> only one string very hard, the other one will vibrate. It's not going to be, you'll see it vibrate. 
vibration will transfer and it will vibrate. The vibration will go through the air and will vibrate the other string as well. So this will happen, they are together, but they have different electrons, so they vibrate at different rate. Similar metal, uh, we can have it in a thermostat. The thermostat in the beginning used to, we used to have a spiral or a spring. Now we have what's called a thermocouple. So a thermocouple is two wires. Color. One of is copper, it's always copper. Don't quote me that, but that my knowledge is always copper. The other one could be anything else. Sometimes cobalt or nickel. And at the tip, the spot welding. So you have both materials in the spot weld. Once this once this tip you hit it, you'll get small, small voltage coming through it. So we'll have voltage between them. But it's very small, it's malleable. Very, very, very small. It's not good for like generation, to like to do generate electricity, but it's good enough to know that what is the temperature over there. So somebody thought, okay, this is interesting. And they realized that the, the, the vibration changes once I increase the temperature. So somebody thought, okay, that's really awesome. Let's we'll see what is the vibration when they put it in ice. And I'll measure the melting point. Okay, and I know the melting point. I mean ice, what is ice temperature? 32. 32 and zero Celsius. So I'm gonna put that as my zero. Then I'm gonna put it in the boiling water. And what is that boiling water temperature at sea level? 100 Celsius to 12 Fahrenheit. So okay, I, I know my beginning, I know my end, then I go and fill in the blank. And do a curve, and I know that now, based on the amount of voltage you give me, I'm going to translate into, into temperature. So, some multimeters, they have that option. That give you leads that are thermocouples. And you put them in here, and you put it in temperature, and you can measure the temperature. I have one, I'll show after the break. And what it does is basically just giving you a millivolt. Actually, I might have one here. Yeah, here it is. So this is a thermocouple. As you can see, it has a welded top. And I'm gonna plug it in here. This thermo this is a multimeter does not know what is the thermocouple in here. But I'm gonna put it into a voltage. And I'll see what voltage I'm gonna get. Sorry, I'm not getting much. So I'm going to put it in my finger. See how it's increasing? Give me 0.2 millivolts. Okay, that's not good. Okay, so I'm going to put it in my finger. See how it's increasing? Give me 0.2 millivolts. Couldn't touch it now. If I put it in a <coughs> more heat, it will produce more voltage. But again, it's not, this is not calibrated read and give you the interpretation of the voltage. But uh, I think this is for fluke. Uh, look, uh, it's a type of uh, multimeter. I put it in there, I put it in temperature, and on temperature reading, it will tell me what is the temperature. So this is a thermocouple, and this also changed the way we measure temperature. Because this is very accurate, very simple, it does not expand or contract or anything. This thermo thermo thermostat has a thermocouple in it. There's no spark, there's nothing. So it's very, very sensitive, and you can put it everywhere. Your car probably has a zillion of those everywhere measure temperature. There's one in the AC, one in the output, one in everywhere. And it reads those little... Thin one? Huh? Thin one? This, is this for temperature? Um, Could be. Good question. Okay, look at the manual. You have know a screwdriver? A little one? Huh? You have know a screwdriver, a little one? I have one on. You go up very fast. Okay. okay. So, uh, instead of another, you type of alloys, they always come with new ideas, the guy who discovered this idea, his name is Don Seabat, Seabat. Uh, <coughs> he's an current in conductive material, and based on that we can measure the voltage. Different currents give you different voltage, current is the flow and vibration, and calibration again is done usually by, by the manufacturer. Again, the primitive way to do it, stick it in ice, stick it in hot water and see what it gives you. Give you 100 
or two twelve in hot water, it's really not okay. Give you zero in ice, then that's okay. So this is thermoelectrical generation. What about does anybody go camping? Yeah. So this is something you can buy from REI or any of those camp camping places. And basically, it's a thermal pot. You can make a fire in the woods. So basically, that you can charge your phone. Same concept: copper and something else. It doesn't give you a lot, but it's enough to charge your phone while you're making some tea. So it's called a thermal pot. It uses it uses same concept, but it's not really that much of voltage. Thermocouples again, the similar metals, a voltmeter. <coughs> Kinetic energy and how did we come up with the idea of, of trying to generate electricity using movement? And this was very, very new and it was a new concept came in the late 1800s. Let's see if the C2 works. We'll watch this uh, video at the end of the class. It's a very long video. We'll do half of this class and half of the next class. But uh, it's an hour long. Oh, true. Huh? It's a whole shoot. You can watch it at home too. But it's uh, very, very informative. Helps you understand what is electricity and how did somebody realize that there is a relationship between magnets and electricity. And for a long time, there was a war between scientists. There is a relation, there is no relation. There's magnet, but there's no relationship between magnetism and electricity, and if it wasn't for that concept, we would never been able to generate electricity the way we do now. And uh, we'll watch the video on portions and see how, how it goes. <clears throat> so conductor and insulator, going back to the periodic table, elements with full glass orbits are insulators. We agree on that. Examples, carbon-based molecules are usually insulators. Again, I said that last class, is there an absolute insulator? No. Everything will conduct at the right voltage. So no matter how insulation, how much insulation you have, do not trust that it will be safe to touch. Elements with most electrons in the last orbits are conductors. Gold is the best conductor. Second is silver. Third is copper. Fourth is aluminum. Is the same, is it the same for heat or electricity? So the material that conducts heat well, will conduct electricity well as well. Because again, heat is energy, electricity is energy. If copper can conduct electricity, it can conduct heat. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it should be the same. It's another form of energy. What are metals? Elements with high mass and low electrons and glass orbits. What are insulators? Material with low mass and full orbits, full electrons and glass orbits. What about semiconductors? As a beginning of a new age, it changed our lives. Silicon Valley. What are, what are semiconductors? Somebody, some genius, that his name, he realized that there are some materials that are not conductive, but at the right circumstances, they change state. They become conductive. Those are the semiconductors. <coughs> Silicon is one of them. Uh, sand, ceramics. <coughs> Porcelain, they are semiconductors if they are designed well. So what does that mean? How does it work? You get a piece of silicon. And we use it as a switch, put a wire through it. If it's, if it's dormant, it's not conductive. However, if we give it some voltage, it becomes conductive. It changes its uh, property. <coughs> And that was a big, big turnaround for electronics. Because now we have small material that will help us do close and open a circuit without to have actual switch. There used to be time when we used to have to call somebody and you call the operator and they will go to a switchboard and take your line and put it in somebody's line. Mm -hmm. Manually, yeah. There was time, when was that, 60s, 60s? Wasn't that far. But it was manual switching. When the mainframe computer, the first computer was as big as this room, full of metallic switches and relays. We'll talk about relays again. It's how we make decisions. Because, and this was the beginning of the whole binary revolution. What is binary? Zero and one. 
So this is zero and ones, we can, we, we start to convert everything to zero and ones. And convert everything to digital form because we can, zero and one is the switch on or switch off. So this was the beginning of binary, on and off. On and off, then we have, how many now? What is the processing power now? We have uh, some processor, five gigahertz. Five gigahertz means five gigahertz of switches turning on and off as you want it to be. It's mind boggling. When you look at a, a phone picture and it says it's two megapixels, now what do you have, 16 pixels? So two, two megapixels, that's two million pixels. That means there is a grid and a matrix that has two million dots that can be zero and one. And the colors are not a function, of course. At the beginning it was black and white. So let's not go too far. I get excited about electronics. But again, this is the idea, zero and one. We can convert everything to zero and one. And that was like very easy to make things electronic. Oh yeah, I can put a uh, conversation to zero and one. That's amazing. Before that, it was all completely analog, which means it's a vibration. Wave going up and down. AM and FM radio, where you have to tra transform a whole wave up and a whole wave down, it doesn't go far. Because again, the wave is not going to go as far as this zero and one. And uh, now we have fiber optics. Fiber optics, what does it do? It's zero and one, it's very quickly. It's mind boggling. Let's not go too far. Semiconductors gave us the ability to do small, small, tiny, minute switches. If I look at this board, this board is, it's okay. It has some <laughs> semiconductors in it. What are these? These are physical relays. If I take one of them out, I'll pass one out. These are, if you look at it, it has mechanical linkage, a coil that will pull in the mechanical linkage and will give you one. Or give you zero, to let go. It has some actual switches here, and it has some processing. Uh, if we look at the primary controls here, So this is the evolution of primary controls. This is the primary control from the 60s. It's very heavy, has only one button, very confusing. By the way, they are still in business. They are still there. It has a mechanical, it has a mechanical. Oh, It doesn't do much, it has only three wires, not a lot of control, and not a lot of options. So, not really like healthy, not really safe look. Mechanical, mechanical, and not a lot of logic to it. This is the brand new one, the fourth generation now. tells you what's going on all the time. Look how light and small it is. Silicon wafer, solid state, not, nothing moving. That's the new control. It does so many things, have a lot of information. Easy to do, easy, no wire anymore. And it has controls for everything that goes into the oil burner. So this is as, as basic as it was, and this is as the new technology. More control, more safety, LCD, nothing moving. So moving part, less moving part mean less chance of breaking. So this doesn't break as fast as this one. At least if it breaks, you know what's broken it, and you can change it. This one is very frustrating to know what's wrong, what's happening. I pass it around. So and this is the new, the new control, and it does everything that the other one does. Uh, so that's the, the gear of semiconductors. Again, there's no perfect insulator. What about air? Is air an insulator? No. 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 10,000 volts will see a spark jumping. Air is not a good insulator. I mean, it's a good insulator, but again, everything conducted the right voltage. Okay, let's take a 10 minutes break. So, video.